It was a small indie film with an incredible performance, and they posted far and wide all across social media, go see this film, this performance is incredible, and she should be nominated for an Academy Award. And it was just like a small indie day and date film, but because talent was behind it and they were vocal about it, it made all the difference in the world. Hi, and welcome back to Studio Binder Academy. I'm Brandon. Today, we're speaking with theatrical booker Suzanne Jacobson of Suzanne Jacobson, Inc., who's distributed films such as To Leslie and Loving Vincent. Suzanne, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So to start off with, could you tell us uh, your story, how you got here? And was there anything that drew you to film or the distribution specifically? Uh, let's see. How did I get here? So, um, yeah, I've always, always, always loved film. And um, I was kind of at a career crossroads, like, it was a long time ago. I don't want to say how long ago. Probably many more years than your life. And um, <laughs> I got, I was hired for like a temp position at Sony Pictures in one department where I was miserable. But I met someone in a different department, well, in a different area. Of, it was all a part of Sony Pictures releasing. And he mm -hmm. uh, was the head of Sony Pictures Repertory, which was the entire Columbia Library. And he needed someone to work with him. So he hired me and that's how I got started. And I fell in love with it because one, I'm a big believer in the theatrical experience. I know that when people dream of making a movie, it's not for a 12 year old to watch on their iPhone. It's <laughs> you seen in a movie theater. And the people who work on the um, the programming side of this industry are just the most wonderful people. They're the ones who run these indie art theaters around the country. I mean, they're really doing God's work and I get to work with them. So I get to work with people who love movies, are engaged with their audiences, and I get to also make the um, dreams of the filmmaker come true because they get to have their movies play in front of audiences. And it's it's just incredibly rewarding on that part of it is incredibly rewarding. Now, distribution seems to be an all encompassing term for how movies end up on a theater screen. Having worked in the independent world, what are the basic steps a film takes to be screened in a theater? Uh, well, one, the film has to warrant it, which can be a very hard conversation to have, especially now since the pandemic, the industry has changed so much mm -hmm. and not for the better on the theatrical side. Honestly, I mean, I'm sure, you know, everybody knows that they don't mm -hmm. you know people don't go to the movies as much. So for a film now to warrant a theatrical release, it really has to be up to snuff. If you're a filmmaker and you've finished your film, um, Sometimes your digital distributor will do theatrical. Most often they carve it out. They don't want any part of it. They just want to sell your film to streamers. Mm -hmm. And then you can either <clears throat> try to get theaters on your own to play the film, or you can hire a booker like me to help you. And a lot of the streamers have bookers who they work with. So that that's what happens is I get referred so a lot of filmmakers get referred to me from their um, whoever it is who who they have chosen to do their digital streaming for them. Okay, excellent, excellent. Now I, I know you don't work in the acquisitions, but could you speak to the general process of how that works? How film rights are obtained? Sort of like distributors get our set links to certain films and they watch it and they do, they look at the whole package, who's in it, who made it, who directed it, who's going to support it. And then I think from there they decide and also how much is being asked for it to, to mm -hmm. acquire it. And then from there is how they decide if they want to acquire the film or not. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, as a theatrical booker, what are your main responsibilities? Well, uh, I have to determine the 
um, the when it's going to happen, set the the open date and figure out the um, theatrical strategy. How wide is it going to go? Where is it going to play? Um, coordinate Q and A. Um, negotiate the terms. Send all the marketing materials to the theaters. Make sure they got them. That the film is properly listed on their website. Um, make mm -hmm. sure that the distributor is doing what they said they're going to do. That they're working to promote the film on their end, and then do the um, collections at the end of the process. Now, one common question that a lot of filmmakers ask themselves once they finish their film is, "What now?" Um, you know, so say, let's say I just made a movie and I'm looking to get it distributed. What should I do as a filmmaker to enable that or facilitate that? Well, I mean, I would say to filmmakers, because I've encountered this over and over and over again, they have this overwhelming desire to make a certain movie and they, you know, they wait and they use all their money and they make the movie, but they don't have a plan for it. They don't mm. have really a thought out plan once it's made, what do I want to do with it? I like to equate it to when like someone redoes their home. They mm -hmm. redo their entire house. They spend all their money. They go upstairs. They look at their bedroom window and they look at their lawn, which is completely destroyed. And <laughs> they have to have no plan and no money to deal with the thing that is the first thing that people see of their home. They've just spent all this money on the interior, but the first impression is not there. And it, it's the same. Mm. Usually filmmakers use up all their money making their movie. And it's very hard to get acquired for a theatrical release. A lot of times the filmmakers have to do that themselves, but they've spent all their money making the film. So it's, mm. it's difficult. So you would say kind of in that early filmmaking process to kind of, you know, budget that into the budget uh, and be aware of that? Have a plan of how you realistically what you realistically think the life of your film is going to look like is it going to have okay. a theatrical release does it warrant it and again to warrant a theatrical release you need either name talent or you mm. need influencers in the film or people who are going to promote your film for you and and or some sort of compelling documentary where you can easily access your audience. So you really, okay. you really have to have a plan from the outset. Just telling a story that you've always wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's wonderful. But does that mean that it needs to play in theaters, especially since the pandemic? Probably not. Because okay. an empty theater is a sad place. <laughs> it is. It is. Now, is there anything that the filmmakers, the cast and or crew can do to help uh, facilitate being able to distribute a film theatrically? Absolutely. I mean, if you if you cast someone who is named talent, you mm -hmm. really have to have a conversation with them from the outset about um, how willing they're going to be to meaningfully support the film. Because if you have someone okay. who is known in the film and they say yes, I will come for q and A. I I will post about this on social media. I will ask all my friends to post about this on social media. That helps a theatrical release to happen. And is there any legalities in putting that into a contract? I mean, I think you can write that clause in, but it's always depending, you know, anything can happen. They can get COVID and then they can't mm. show up, but they can still post. But I mean, what so often happens is that name talent are cast in a film and they vaguely say that they will support the film once it's ready mm -hmm. and then they want nothing to do with it or yeah. they don't have time or their agent is an obstructionist and won't let them because their agent yeah. or their manager want them to focus on something else. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So yeah, just definitely have a plan for what realistically you would like the where the, the film to go and then kind of base that, base your decisions off of that, correct? Yeah, and if you have the budget to cast name talent and you really want the film to have a theatrical release, do what you can to secure, to express to said talent 
the importance of them actively participating in the promotion of the film on the theatrical level once that time comes. It yeah. makes all the difference in the world. Even if it's if it's a producer of the film mm -hmm. who's somebody who is well known, if they promote it, everything's about social media these days, unless you have a hundred million dollars to spend in marketing, yeah. which most indie films don't. Absolutely. Meaningful, <laughs> meaningful participation from name people makes all the difference in awareness. Now, as far as obtaining uh, distribution, could you speak to how a film might obtain distribution at a film festival? They have to be very lucky. <laughs> I mean, usually um, most films that have distribution, yeah, they, I mean, for what I've seen mm -hmm. is that you either have to have an agent helping you or you just the filmmakers themselves go to these um, these distribution companies and see if they can get interest, if they can find interest for the film from these indie distribution companies. But it's a challenge to get to have your film be acquired for sure. And is there is there any type of like negotiation process that within that, like say say that filmmaker had a created a plan of how they wanted it released and then a buyer potentially comes to them to buy the rights. Is there any negotiation of say buyer says, well, this is what we're going to do. And the filmmaker comes back with, well, this is what we wanted to do. Yeah. There's tons of negotiations and a lot of okay. times it doesn't work out because not filmmakers, especially like if it's their first film, mm -hmm. let's just say they're not always realistic about what it is that they've made and what it means okay. for the market out there in general. But but also, I was going to say that, um, you know, it's a double-edged sword to have an agent. On the one hand, the agent has access to the people who could potentially um, acquire the film, so that's great. But agents tend to ask for a lot more money than most indie mm. distributors are willing or able to pay. So it's a double-edged sword. As far as obtaining distribution, are film markets a, a good place to find that? I mean, they, they can be, but it's it's not it's not easy. I mean, I've worked with so many films that um when you well are using festival and market as the same because I mean a lot of film festivals are are film markets too. So, are we referring to the same? True. Thing? I, I was thinking more of the. I, I I do get the similarities, but between those, um, but I was thinking more in terms of like AFI versus, uh, you know, a, a local film festival that someone might view the the film. Do you at. mean AFM? AFM. I, I'm sorry. I, I said AFI. AFM. Yes. Um. Well, yeah, I mean, films do get acquired at AFM for sure. A lot of times those are just international rights mm. because that's AFM usually it's buyers for international markets. So then they okay. the filmmakers <laughs> still have to figure out their domestic plan. Got you. Got you. Okay. All right. Now, as far as that distribution process goes, um, from the uh, aside from the obvious budget differences, are there any differences between a studio film and an independent film? Yeah. Yeah, because the studios can distribute their own films themselves. Okay. Okay. So it's more of a built-in kind of thing where the indies are doing more of the leg legwork themselves. Well, yeah. I mean, if a studio makes a film, they're going to distribute it themselves or they already have a deal in place to co-distribute it with another studio or another big production company. Okay. And we're talking about like an individual who had a dream to make a movie, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they make it and then they're like, wait, nobody's knocking down my door. <laughs> film. I mean, it's hard. Like I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's hard to get it sold. It's, it's hard to get to sell off the rights. And, mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to get a deal that includes theatrical because theatrical is expensive. Going back, you said determining whether a film is worthy of a theatrical release. Um, you know, I know you said name talent. Um, are there any other aspects that would facilitate a, the a theatrical worthiness? 
yeah, what's the story? Is it compelling? Is it something that people want to see? Um, and what are the production values? Because honestly, mm-hmm. a lot of indie films look somewhat amateurish. And unless it's like a genre type film, like if it's a if it's a drama that looks amateurish, that's going to be you don't want to do that. You're going to not get mm-hmm. good reviews. People aren't going to go see it unless there's some like hot star in there who is going to promote that film. And then it doesn't matter what it is. And would you say it's worth allocating part of the budget in doing your own market research or searching out distributors that specialize in that genre? Yeah, I mean, you can. Sure. It's good to know when you make a film, it is really good to know what the options are for it after it's completed. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I was speaking with, uh, with a, a producer, I believe. And he's like, yeah, there's not a whole lot of practical people on a film set. So it, it definitely makes sense to be realistic of where you expect it to go. <laughs> right. And to have money left over. Mm, definitely. Definitely. Now, as when a film, when the film rights are obtained, what are the next steps, at least in your position as, as a theatrical booker from there? Well, what I encounter, so they set the um, the streaming date and mm-hmm. then a lot of times, so what a lot of what I've been doing since the pandemic, because everything did change from the pandemic. I mean, movie theaters were closed, streaming took over. So now if a film um, has a digital distributor, a lot of times the filmmakers will come to me for uh, asking for like one-off promotional screenings. Mm. So that's Q and A screening. So that's what I set up for them. And then they have to, they have to pay me to do that. They get to keep the film rental. I don't keep the film rental if any money is made, but um, it can certainly do a lot to raise the awareness of the film for streaming. But really these are promotional screenings because you know, it's, it's thrilling for the filmmakers to see their film being played in a theater Um, and it raises awareness, but it's really all raising awareness for, for the streaming in the end. Now, could you also describe the exhibition windows that a film will typically go through? Sure. Um, So the minimal window for um, the chains, at least that they require, if you want to play, if you want to play with them is um, a 17 day window, which is nothing nothing but that's that's the minimum that they require and the um the indies pretty much follow that as well but the indies are a lot more flexible if they are really interested in the film they don't really care that much about the streaming window i mean let me say Mm. let me be clear they do not like playing films with no window but if it's a film that they're interested in they'll do it anyway all right and has there been in any other major changes, you know, post pandemic uh, and post streaming? Yeah, seventeen day window. It used to be a six month window. Oh wow, and that's now a it's drastic a seventeen change. day window. <laughs> uh, the, and indie theaters used to not play films that were not windowed, and now they will because they have to because it, everything has changed so much. Wow. Wow. Six months to 17 days. That it used to be <laughs> two just... years. When I was at Sony, it was two years. It wow. was a two year theatrical window before anything else. Wow. That's it's, it's amazing how much the industry is, is changing and evolving on a second to second basis. Um, but yeah, I, I can definitely see how streaming is essentially killing the theater system, unfortunately. Pretty much. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's killing it. It's hurting it. I'm not going to say killing it. I shouldn't shouldn't say killing. Yeah. Because you can't duplicate the theatrical experience at home. I mean, I guess if you have your own home theater and you invite all your friends to come see the film, (laughs) I'll come in for Q&A. But it's very hard to duplicate the streaming experience, the the, uh, theatrical experience at home. And that's what theaters still have is you can go mm. and have a truly special experience that you're just not going to have have at home it's just that people used to go 
30 times a year to have this special experience. And now maybe they go two or three times. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that's why so many theaters have closed since the pandemic. Yeah, I used to I used to I used to live in LA for a pretty long while. Now I would go to the Sunset 5 where they would screen the room and it was such an experience to be in that theater watching that film. I w- you wouldn't be able to experience that anywhere else. Right. <laughs> the magical thing, the theatrical experience is a magical thing and it's the way films are meant to be seen. Definitely. It's just that that's not how they're seen as much Mm. anymore and it's really it's changed the whole feel of the industry definitely definitely now for those who don't know could you explain the differences of a limited theatrical release and a platform release yeah i mean a platform means that you release it in la and new york first and Mm. then you expand around the rest of the country and a limited release I mean, a platform release can be a limited release or it can be a wide release. A limited release just refers to the number of theaters that where you're planning to play. Okay. You know, like right. under 30, what are those numbers? Like under 30 screens okay. is a limited release. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. But you can have a platform release for a wide film. I mean, the way they used to do that all the time pre-pandemic. And then it still happens. Films open and... LA and New York first, and they get the reviews and then they expand out to the rest of the country. That's a platform release. Gotcha. And would you say there are any uh, key aspects to a successful platform release? Get a good publicist. That's why you do it. You do it for the reviews. Excellent. Excellent. Well, there you go. You heard it, folks. Get you a good publicist. Who can really talk to the critic and explain, like, this is what the film is about because... It's very, it's also, it's a strange phenomenon, but it's very hard to get a good review out of the New York Times, which is the most important paper in the country for mm. art review, art film review or indie film reviews. It's very hard to get a good review for an indie release, which I don't understand. They tend to just be strangely critical of these indie films. Hmm. So it's like the onus really falls on the publicist to really talk to the critic to make sure that it's going to at least be a fair review. Now, from your experience, could you share a film that was a um, a platform release that just per- did particularly well? Um, let's see, a platform release that did well. Um, something that's recent. I can't really come up with something that's recent that did well, but I. Do you have an example of an indie film that went wide because of talent? If that would be. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would love to hear about yeah, that. Yeah. So I worked on a film um, for one of my clients earlier. Well, no, it was last year already. <laughs> it was last year. It was <laughs> called um, To Leslie. And it was, a sm- it was a small indie film with an incredible performance. And the lead actress in the film has, um, she has other actress friends who mm-hmm. really got behind her performance and they posted far and wide all across social media, go see this film, this performance is incredible and she should be nominated for an Academy Award. And it was actually a big controversy because she was nominated, the actress was nominated and then people said that that wasn't fair, but I don't see why it wasn't fair. I mean, it yeah. was just, it was an indie film. They, people wouldn't have known about it unless the mm-hmm. celebrities came out to support it. But it ended up playing on over 100 screens. And it was just like a small wow. indie day and date film. But because talent was behind it and they were vocal about it, it made all the difference in the world. Yeah, yeah. I can see how, how important that could be, especially for an indie film that doesn't have a lot of budget to put towards marketing. You know, it's almost that grassroots kind of marketing. It's like people just pulling up by their bootstraps and doing it themselves. Yep. And it really does work. As far as the theatrical potential, how has that evolved? The calculation of that, at least, how has that evolved over the years? Um, On the indie side, it hasn't really changed at all. It's who's in it, what's it about, and how is it going to be supported? 
All right. And could you speak to how it might have changed in bigger studio movies at all? Well, I think it's the same consideration, but then they, they have the marketing budget that the indies don't have. So they can sometimes create a hit out of something that maybe isn't that great of a film, but because they have so much money behind it, they're mm. able to create buzz. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Now, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the box office success of most Hollywood movies is determined by total box office gross, while the independent films are often judged by a per screen or per theater average. Could you explain why that is? No, the per screen average is the judge. I mean, you'll okay. see these big headlines like, um, you know, the latest Marvel movie grosses $100 million mm -hmm. world, worldwide, but... What did it gross per screen? I mean, if it's grossing like $300 per screen, is it that successful? And how much money was spent to get to that $100 million mark? So okay. it does still come down to per screen average. Gotcha. Now, since distribution is changing so much, uh, what advice, if any, would you give to anyone that was interested in getting into distribution? Don't, don't do theatrical. I love it. I'm super passionate about what I do, but it's just, it's too difficult. It's too hard now. Things have changed too much and it's not where the money is. If you want to, okay. if you want to work in distribution, work for a streamer. <laughs> streamer. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. And so speaking in terms of theatrical distribution, how do you see the future of that? I mean... I, I want to be able to sleep at night, so I tell myself that it's going to be okay. I mean, these these uh, one-off Q&A promotional screenings that I've been doing for the last mm -hmm. two years or so, they they fill a hole that is there for sure. Um, I mean, there are fewer theaters there, and so just in general, and there's less money for theatrical, so fewer films are getting that theatrical release. But I've noticed with my clients that sometimes they're able to acquire films that they wouldn't be able to acquire otherwise because they do promise promotional theatrical screenings. So oh, I tell okay. myself like this, you know, it's a ba it's a Band-Aid on a wound, but it's a Band-Aid. It's something. And um, I feel, I feel like it's... um. It's contracted and it's still contracting, but at some point soon, I think it's going to stabilize. And theaters that closed during the pandemic, a lot of them are, um, well, not a lot. Some will reopen and they maybe are going to reopen with a different business model. Like um, mm. the nonprofit theaters tend to do a lot better. The indie nonprofit theaters tend to do a lot better than the for profit theaters because. They have members who are engaged with the programming and they also have a, a base amount of income they get from the memberships. So okay. they can keep operating even if it's been, even if it's a quiet week or a quiet month, they still have income coming in from, member, from their membership. Well, Suzanne, those are all the questions we have for you today. Thank you so much for your incredible insight and information. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Okay, you're so welcome. If you're looking for more interviews or deep dives into the Studio Binder software, be sure to like and subscribe to be notified when new videos are added. I'm Brandon with Studio Binder Academy. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.